While I have very often and repeatedly satirized the language and implied values of the so-called skeptic community, I do actually also believe that skepticism and reason and facts and logic and evidence and all those other buzzwords are actually important. They do mean something, and they are worth thinking about. Greg doesn't seem like a bad person to me. You know, I make these videos and sometimes I'm really mocking of people either to be over the top because I think it's funny, or because I know their minds won't be changed because they're just so far out there. I'm curious, now that I've definitively made him aware that the subjects exist if he does watch this video, if Skeptic will change his mind in accordance with the evidence, or at least develop a new perspective on the issues based on the stuff that I've pointed out. I think this is actually the first time I've genuinely thought maybe some progress is going to happen here, maybe someone's going to watch this and go, oh man, there is science and I missed it. That would be really interesting, wouldn't it? Alright, H Bomber guy. You seem to want a dialogue in which we listen to the other side and show willingness to change our view if we are presented with new evidence. You want to talk and seek the truth. So, let's talk. If you don't remember what this is about, this goes all the way back to April 2017, when Bill Nye's new show on Netflix had an episode dedicated to sex and gender. The skeptic community was seriously triggered by this episode, and several YouTubers made videos decrying the fact that Bill Nye, the science guy, has turned his back on science in favor of SJW ideology. Two months later came the response from the SJW side, as H Bomber guy, no, not that one, the other one. The one with the silly hair. That's the one. H Bomber guy, smug as usual, mocked some of these videos. I invited him to criticize the video that I made on the subject, but got no response. So now, H Bomber guy, I am making a video especially for you. You wanted Armored Skeptic to respond to you. Well, you didn't get Skeptic, but you are getting me. H Bomber Guy's main point, and the warranted one, is that the YouTube skeptics who attacked Knife for his betrayal of science have presented no science to back up their claims. He made two videos on the subject, the first dedicated to rebutting Armored Skeptic, the second aimed at several personalities who are on the right wing side of the skeptic community. I am not going to defend the right wingers because I disagree with them on this issue. And I'm not going to defend Armored Skeptic's video either, because Greg, once again, speaks with authority about a subject he clearly knows very little about. But I am going to criticize what H Bomber guy has to say on this issue. So, H Bomber guy, you made two lengthy videos explaining why the skeptics are wrong on this subject. Please tell us why the SJWs are right. Well, I've spent nearly two months of my life reading data and biology books and studies about trans people and reading about the lived experiences of being trans in order to come to a better understanding before broaching this topic and responding to criticism. Great! So what are your insights? Before realising that most of the criticism didn't do any research and there was really no reason for me to do most of that reading uh, and I've had basically no chances to show all the work I did in this video, and I'm thoroughly disappointed in myself. Oh. So you did all that reading, and you're not going to share any of it with us? Don't you think we could benefit from knowing more about this topic? Don't you think that if you made some arguments of your own, we could then criticize them and present counter-arguments, and as a result we would all get more educated on this issue, and develop more enlightened positions? One with a mind less generous than mine might think that you are just pretending to have done all this reading, to feign superiority over the people you are mocking. But that is what you always do, isn't it, H Bomber guy? You never bother to make any arguments that would support a social justice position. You just find bad videos made by anti-SJWs and ridicule them to score points in the culture war. Well, in that case, I am now going to make a video directly at you and explain to you why those of us who have looked more closely into the issue find it so troubling. Now, I am not a scientist, but that doesn't matter, because this argument is actually not about science. This argument takes place in my ballpark. This is a philosophical argument. I didn't watch Bill Nye's show at the time, because I didn't have access to it. But I watched it now, and I have to tell you guys, I found absolutely nothing wrong with the science on this episode. I think it shows that H Bomber guy is absolutely right when he says that many YouTube skeptics are just parroting each other when it comes to the issue of gender. 
They know that there's something wrong with the ideology that the social justice movement is pushing, but they haven't really figured out what it is yet. So I'll try to help, and in the process, I hope that I will also rehabilitate Nye's image in the eyes of those who felt that their childhood hero has fallen. To clarify, I'm not saying that there was nothing wrong with Nye's show. There was one segment that featured Rachel Bloom wearing a leotard, dancing and rapping. None of which I want to see ever again. The lyrics to her song might have been considered edgy and liberating 30 years ago, but now it just sounded lame and tasteless. There was also an Ice Cream Orgy cartoon, which I personally didn't have much of a problem with, but Armored Skeptic makes a fair criticism when he points out that it makes LGBT people look sexually promiscuous. His point, by the way, was completely lost on each bomber guy. I assume that it is because he is a social justice warrior, and therefore someone who is busy fighting imaginary injustices, so he doesn't know much about the injustices of the real world, and doesn't understand why it might be a bad idea to present LGBT people as promiscuous, especially on American television. But those are not the parts that raise the ire of the skeptic community. The part that pissed everybody off is the part where Bill talks about certain aspects of sex and sexuality, and claims that they are all on a spectrum. The world is a wonderfully diverse place. And as scientists, we use the scientific method to try and understand that diversity. This is what is happening with the study of human sex and sexuality. Right now, biologists, sociologists, anthropologists, they're all trying to figure this out. And they're finding human sexuality is on a spectrum. And if you're like me, and I know I am, <laughs> you're still learning about this field of science. I used to think there were just two settings, male and female. But it's actually a lot sexier than that. Bill discusses four aspects. Sex, by which he means biological sex. Gender. Attraction, also known as sexual orientation. And expression, by which he means gender expression. And he contends that all four are on a spectrum. Here is how Armored Skeptic reacted to the last one. Bill calls the fourth one expression. It's the way people express their gender. Bill, um... Uh, Bill, uh, what's the difference between gender and gender expression? What even is gender expression? Instead of an explanation of what gender expression is, he just cuts to a video about how K-pop is changing the way people in Korea express their gender. That's cool and everything, but what is gender expression? How does it relate to gender? Is there a correlation with biology? Like, what percentage of the population expresses. There's a little secret with gender expression. It, it's, it, it's made up. It's fashion. It's fucking fashion. It's a trend. It's trendy for boys to wear makeup. It's trendy for girls to wear bow ties. That's it. This totally trivializes the other three things you talked about. There aren't even any statistics or studies or psychological papers or polls or anything. So this is where Greg opened himself up to H. Bomber guy's very justified ridicule, as the latter showed how easy it is to find scientific studies that explore the connection between biology and gender expression. I think, however, that Greg's main problem is that he is confused by the terms, and needs them to be clarified first. I actually already made a video explaining them, and it just so happens that this video was in response to the future Mrs. Skeptic, who expressed similar confusion after Nye's show. So instead of doing it all again, I'll just use the relevant part of that video. So, first of all, there's biological sex. That's easy to understand. There are certain anatomical components that determine our biological sex, such as genitals, chromosomes, hormones and more. If you are male, there's a certain range in which these components will typically be manifested in your body, and for females the range is different. Gender expression is also pretty easy to understand, and it means the way that the two genders typically express themselves, like wearing a dress if you're a woman or wearing a tie if you're a man. Gender expression is mostly a social construct, although part of it is probably based in biology. The fact that men and women tend to express themselves differently emotionally, for instance, is partly a social construct, but probably also partly the result of the different hormonal makeup. Note what I said there. Gender expression is a social construct, like Armored Skeptic claimed, but it is also partly tied to our biology. The funny thing is that by denying this, Greg is actually taking the social justice position, which claims that there is no connection between biological sex and gender expression, whereas H. Bomber guy, by debunking him, 
is taking the anti-SJW position. Again, I think it simply demonstrates a general confusion among YouTubers when discussing this issue. Now, Greg objects to Bill Nye's characterization of these aspects as being on a spectrum. He claims that those who don't fall into the categories of male and female are very rare, so describing it as a spectrum is misleading. But Greg, those who fall within the categories of male and female are also on the spectrum. Every individual is different when it comes to the masculine and feminine mix that constitutes them. When it comes to biological sex, for instance, one man might have higher levels of testosterone than another man, and that takes him more towards the masculine end of the spectrum. When it comes to gender expression, everyone is different in the types of expressions that signify gender. And when it comes to attraction, some people will be attracted only to feminine traits and signifiers, like a slender figure, long hair, boobs, soft skin, etc. Other people will be attracted only to masculine traits and signifiers, like height, broad shoulders, muscles, facial hair, etc. And some people can be attracted to mainly feminine traits, but also to height, so they like tall women, or also to height and muscles, and so forth, until they might find themselves attracted to members of both genders. In short, Bill Nye is absolutely right when he says that we are on a spectrum. It's what science tells us, and it's what everyday life tells us as well. So what is the problem with the social justice ideology on this issue? The problem begins when we start to talk about identity. So let's get to the aspect that Bill calls gender, and the SJWs call gender identity. Now the next aspect of this is gender. It works the same way. We used to think of gender and sex as synonymous, but these days we use these two words differently. Sex is biological, gender is how you identify yourself and your experience. I am biologically male, and I identify myself as a man. This, let's say that's me right there. <laughs> and then this is me identifying myself as a man. So my sex and gender are on the same side of the spectrum. But there are people whose sex and gender are not the same. So, what is gender identity? It is how you identify yourself on the spectrum. How do you identify yourself? Is identity something that you are born with? No, identity is not biological. You are not born with an identity, you are born with traits. Biological traits, personality traits, tastes, talents, etc. According to these traits, you are being placed, and later on you place yourself, within pre-existing categories of identity that best define you. Identity, then, is a social construct which individuals fit themselves into. I was born with male biological components, and typical male personality traits. Society therefore tagged me with the gender identity of male. Later on in life, when I started to develop my political views, I realized that these views placed me in the liberal category, so I assumed the identity of a liberal. As I developed my interests, I've realized that I'm drawn to philosophy, so I assume the identity of a philosopher. It is also possible that a group of people will discover that they have a shared interest that is not covered by an existing category, and develop a new identity based on it. But one thing in common to all of those identities is, none of them exist in your biology. They are all constructed socially, and you adopt them. Now, as we mentioned, we are all on a spectrum, and no individual is exactly similar to the other. So the question becomes, how can many individuals share the same identity? The answer is that our everyday language is flexible, and no term in it has a rigid definition. Rather, it works on the principle known as family resemblance. In every category there are items that are more typical to it, i.e. contain more of its typical components, and items that are less typical to it. Thus, because our language is flexible in that way, we can call them all by the same name, give them the same identity. In a liberal society, we espouse pluralism, the ability of people to form new identities, which anyone can then adopt. However, there is one thing that should not be the basis of an identity, and that is biological traits. In a liberal society, identity should always be a choice, which we have the freedom to either adopt or discard. Since we cannot choose biological traits, they must not be considered an identity. Unfortunately, we have inherited some such identities from a less liberal past, but we need to learn how to overcome this past. Race, for instance, should not be considered an identity. Race may exist as a biological category, but should not exist as a social category. Just like we do not treat having blonde hair as an identity different from having black hair, so should we not treat having yellow skin as an identity different from having black skin. 
they should both be considered as variants of the same identity. We have unfortunately inherited the world in which race did become an identity, but a liberal society should aspire to overcome that, and erase these distinctions. Similarly, sexual orientation should not be considered an identity, but merely a matter of taste. Just like we don't consider people who drink tea with sugar to have a different identity from those who drink it without sugar, so should we overcome the legacy of seeing people who are attracted to the opposite gender as having a different identity from those who prefer the same gender. Now when it comes to sex and gender, it is slightly different. Here, on a biological level, we are talking about two differently functioning systems, of male and female. So the tradition that defines two biological sexes makes sense, and is not something that we need to overcome. We must remember, however, that these two identities cover a wide variety of instances, and are not rigidly defined. The science of today notes that some individuals don't correspond to the dichotomy of XX and XY. Some, for instance, have XYY syndrome, and there are other possible variations. Science refers to these individuals as intersex people, but as a society, we should not single them out by assigning an identity to them. They should be considered either an atypical male or an atypical female, based on which sexist components they have more of. Gender, however, is based not just on biology but also on psychology. There is, of course, a strong correlation between the two. There are personalities, expressions and tastes that typify those of the female biological sex, and those that typify the male sex. Traditionally, this led to a rather narrow spectrum of behavior that was expected of men and women, and those who fell outside of this spectrum had to conform to it, and felt strong alienation as a result. But the liberal society has progressed and realized the large variety that is out there, and now allows men and women to express themselves in any way they want. There are even those whose psychology is so atypical that it goes into the spectrum of the opposite gender. Some people have personalities and expressions that are typical to the members of the other biological sex, and some even feel alienated to their own biological body, and would rather have the other sex's body. Those are what we call transgendered people, and liberal society has accepted that psychology counts more than biology, so they should be allowed to change their gender. And, finally, there are those rare cases of individuals who fall right in the middle, who have about the same amount of masculine and feminine components, either biologically or psychologically. Let's call them non-gendered. For the non-gendered people, liberal society should create another category. We should be careful, however, not to define this category as another gender, as an identity with distinct characteristics. This is something that you can find in some illiberal societies, societies that have a more rigid definition of male and female. In these societies, those who fall outside of these definitions are considered to have a different nature, and are thus defined as a third gender. Again, this third gender usually has a strict definition, and all members of it are expected to conform and adopt the behaviors and social roles it entails. A liberal society should not stigmatize its atypical members in such a way. What I've described until now is what a liberal society aspires to, what it considers to be social justice. But, as we know, the term social justice has recently been co-opted by anti-liberal forces, which are using it as a cloak to further the political agenda. The ideology is based on the Marxist idea that society should not be regarded as a congregation of free individuals, but as a battle between oppressor and oppressed. While liberal society was focused on identity, making laws to protect minority identities, the Marxists were fruitlessly trying to convince the working class that it is oppressed. Having failed at that, they rebranded themselves, and leached onto the concept of identity, trying to convince certain identities that they are oppressed in Western liberal society. They do it in all sorts of ways, but in this video, we will focus on how they are handling the so-called non-binary gender identities. First, let's sum up the liberal position. We know from science that there is a strong correlation between biological sex, gender identity and gender expression, but it is not a one-to-one -one correlation. There is a spectrum. So, let's draw a graph. This graph has absolutely no scientific validity. It is just something that I drew to illustrate the idea. We will find that most individuals fall near the peak of the curves, where we find those whose gender identity and expression are typical of their biological sex. But some individuals' gender expressions are atypical of their gender identity, and some individuals' gender identity is typical of the opposite biological sex. All of these are accepted as valid in a liberal society. There are also those who are right in the middle, which I termed non-gendered. Liberal society would have accepted them by now as well, 
if the SJWs didn't mess up the works by trying to introduce a completely different picture. So what is the picture that the social justice movement is trying to impose? Well, first of all, they are exploiting the fact that science says that there isn't a perfect correlation between sex, gender and expression, and twist it to deceive uninformed people into thinking that there is no correlation at all. And, once they make them believe that gender identity isn't correlated with biology, they establish the idea that it is completely a social construct. And since it is a social construct, that means that the normative feminine and masculine behaviors are something that is forcefully imposed on us. In liberal logic, the normative is what most people are by nature, and we know that there are individuals whose nature is different, but that doesn't mean that there is anything wrong with them. In SJW logic, the normative is a social construct that is imposed on everyone, and therefore a form of oppression. Thus, the normative is evil, and needs to be obliterated. For me personally, the gender binary enforced a lot of stereotypes on me when I was coming out as transgender and transitioning to be a man. I felt a, a pressure, a societal pressure to fit into a certain stereotype or box. When you listen to young YouTubers who fall outside of the gender normative, and who are influenced by social justice ideology, this is always what you hear. They never tell you that someone tried to force them to conform to normative gender expressions. They only complain that they felt pressure to do so. Well, pressure to conform is what human society is about, and we all feel it. The biggest fun of being a teenager is to rebel against this pressure, and be an eyesore to everyone. But these kids are missing out on all this fun, because their minds are being shaped by this regressive ideology. Social justice is victimizing these kids, telling them that they are being oppressed by the fact that there is something in existence called normative behavior. Thus, these kids develop a victim mentality, and become miserable. Now, if Bill Nye would have said that there is no correlation at all between these aspects, or that the spectrum isn't shaped like a curve with their typical and atypical instances, then I would have had a problem with him. But it didn't, so what's the problem? Eventually I realized that what bothered Ahmad Skeptic, and other people, is that Bill didn't bother to refute the picture presented by the SJWs. But you guys need to remember that this is a show made by normies for normies, and most normies have no idea about all this social justice crap. They are still in the earlier phase, where they need to learn the difference between sex and gender. The show's producers try to be hip and appeal to today's culture, but they don't know enough about it, as evidenced by the fact that they've allowed this abomination to happen. So if they didn't bother to debunk the SJW ideology, I tend to believe that it is simply because they are not aware of it. I hope I've made my point that there was nothing wrong with the sense of Bill Nye's show. So let's now leave the sense behind, and start to talk about the ideology of the social justice movement. As far as I know, nothing of what I am about to present has any basis in science. I tried to search for articles that support the SJW arguments, and couldn't find any. But I am not a scientist, so I could be wrong. As I said in the beginning of the video, this is meant to be a conversation. If you have the science, you are welcome to present it. As we mentioned, the social justice ideologues are preying on the minds of people who feel alienated to the normative gender expressions, teaching them that they are oppressed. Instead of explaining to them that the categories of male and female are wide and flexible enough to include them, they are telling them that they fall outside of these categories. In their terms, they fall outside of the gender binary, and that is why these kids refer to themselves as non-binary people. The non-binaries, in SJW ideology, are not just those rare cases that fall right in the middle, it's anyone who is atypical to their gender. And in the process of leading them to believe in that, they are also instilling anti-liberal ideas into their minds. Let's listen to these so-called non-binary people as they express themselves on YouTube, and find out what these ideas are. But basically, let's go back to this line. One's male, ten's female, right? Your gender can fit anywhere along this line. So, let's say, um... Most cisgendered females are usually around an eight. But that, that's easy enough to understand, isn't it? You can fall anywhere along this line in gender things. You could be sitting on 7.825 if you want, or 2.9873. It, basically, it's infinite. There is an infinite amount of genders, which is totally wicked. Did you catch the switch? Up to the last sentence, there was nothing wrong with what was said. We are all slightly different, so we are all on a different point on the spectrum. But, in this ideology, we are not just different instances of the same two genders, sharing an identity according to the concept of family resemblance. No, no. 
Every one of these instances is a different gender, a different identity. The concept of family resemblance, which every human language has always been based on, is being cast aside in the name of ideology. Instead, we get the idea that every gender identity should be rigidly defined, and if there is a slight difference between the way two individuals experience and express their gender, that means that there are two different gender identities. The gender identity that defines those who are on spot 2.9873 on the spectrum belongs only to those who are at that spot, whereas 2.9874 is already a different gender identity. And you can be sure that they are busy giving names to those identities. Hi, my name is Grace, I'm a Gemini, and I identify as gray gender. Cool, I didn't know that. Welcome to it! That's awesome! I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm gonna let you finish. But it's really hard for me to listen to you guys. I've watched many of these non-binary videos, and every time they get to the part where they enthusiastically introduce their gender, there's this thing that keeps bouncing around inside my head, and driving me crazy. Hang on, let me just let it out first. Oh, uh, glad to meet you. Name Tigger. T I double G R. That spells Tigger. The wonderful thing about Tigger is Tigger's a wonderful thing. The top's a minute of rubber, the bottom's a minute of spring. The bouncy, trouncy, flouncy, pouncy, fun, 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 fun. But the most wonderful thing about Tigger is I'm the only one. Yeah, this is who you guys remind me of. Winnie the Pooh is a children's story. And children are already expected to laugh and understand how absurd it is for someone to tell us how proud he is to be a member of a wonderful category of beings, only to then reveal that he is the only member of that category. But you don't find it absurd at all, do you? For you it is perfectly logical to turn your individual experience into a category, in which you will be the only member. So I feel like my gender exists in a place between woman and agender. What do you mean a place between? We can't have that. Better find a name for what you are right away. Oh right, I forgot. You have a name for the in-between state as well. In short, this is an entirely new logic. The traditional logic treats every term in our language as a category that covers many items. These items are all slightly different from one another, but they share a family resemblance, so they can all be grouped under the same name. This new logic, however, sees every item as a category of its own. And based on this new logic, they want to turn their own private psychology into a gender identity. The place where this new logic is allowed to thrive is Tumblr, and there are places that list all the gender identities that dwell there. The last count that I saw listed over 320 genders, among them Glimra gender, a faintly shining, wavering gender, a Bima gender, a gender which is profound, deep and infinite, and Magi gender, a gender that is mostly gender, and the rest is something else. The wonderful thing about Tiggers is Tiggers are wonderful chaps. They're loaded with vim and with finger. They love to leap in your lap. They jumpy, bumpy, clumpy, thumpy, fun, 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 fun. But the most wonderful thing about Tiggers is I'm the only one. Now why the hell should we accept this new logic? And destroy the logic that has been part of humankind since it learned to think? Because their logic is not just something by which we understand reality. It actually represents reality. The gender binary refers to there being only two genders, man or woman, in society. The gender binary is a social construct that essentially limits the roles that men and women can play in society. It predisposes them to certain stereotypes and to certain types of roles that they should be playing in their day-to-day -day lives. In reality, there are infinite genders. I think that gender exists on a continuum and on a spectrum. So the claim is that while the binary definition of male and female identities is a social construct, the non-binary gender identities actually exist in reality. But, as we said before, identity is always a social construct. To show us that your identity actually represents reality, you will have to show us that it is part of your biology. You will have to show that there is a part of your brain that says, I am both gender. But there is no science that supports this claim. Although they will try to tell you that there is. One study published in early 2016 in the International Review of Psychiatry found that there are a significant number of people who identify outside of the gender binary. Such non-binary gender identity or expression has been present over time and across different global cultures. Non-binary people might appear to be a relatively recent and under-researched phenomenon, but it is likely that some people who previously would have identified as trans within the gender binary may have identified outside of the binary if that discourse had been available to them. Lots of other studies, all of which I'll link to down below, have interviewed non-binary people and attempted to learn about their lived experiences as a way to help better define this experience for further research. That's science! Those are scientific studies! And if you refuse to acknowledge qualitative research, that's your own anti-science bias. 
No, Riley. As you said yourself, these articles merely interviewed people who identified themselves as non-binary, because they have adopted the discourse of the social justice movement. The articles provide no scientific support to the claim that these identities are based in biology. Let me try to explain to you how you're being deceived here, Riley. No one has ever denied that there is a wide spectrum of human experiences regarding gender. In the past, however, those who fell outside of the normative spectrum were regarded as unnatural, as people who suffer from a problem and need to be cured. There are even some right-wing people who think this way today. But liberal society, based on scientific research, has now determined that there is nothing unnatural about these atypical people. They simply represent a diversity of human nature, and are perfectly well just the way they are. This is where perception changed, and this is what people like Bill Nye are trying to teach those who have still not fully internalized the change. But then came the social justice movement, and claimed that we should define these atypical individuals as different gender identities. And they have managed to convince you, and others, that this is what the recent change in our science and perception was about. How does a social justice ideology reach these people? Well, it is mainly teachers in schools and academies, who are using their position to poison the minds of their students with this anti-liberal social justice dogma. Young people are usually egocentric, and that's a healthy thing because they need to focus on developing their personality. Eventually, however, they need to step out of their egocentricity and adopt the identities that society offers them, which best suit them. But instead of helping them in this process, these SJW teachers are providing them with the logic that allows them to maintain their egocentricity, by creating an identity that will be all their own. They don't really care about what it might do to the psyche of these vulnerable kids, because it is all part of the ideological battle. But why is it so important to them to get people to adopt new gender identities? Because the liberal society has created laws that protect minority identities, and the social justice movement exploits that to try to undermine this society. It is considered wrong in our society to deny someone's identity. This principle was created to protect people who were being denied the right to express themselves in a certain way, to believe in something, and to associate with each other on the basis of their identity. None of these rights are being denied anymore in liberal society, so radical leftists need to find new ways to portray it as oppressive. By creating these new identities, and demanding of us to recognize them, they can achieve that goal. And it works because as liberals, we cannot accept these new identities. If we add more gender identities to our language, we will be labeling people against their will. These kids may think that this identity that they create belongs only to them, but that's not how the human mind works. The logic that turns every identity into a category that includes several items is part of our nature, and is not something that we can avoid. Our mind evolved to think in categories. We need to be able to recognize that this food that we never saw before is similar to foods that we did see before and belongs to the category apple, and therefore can be nutritious. Or that this animal that we never saw before belongs to the category lion, so we should run away from it. So once you create an identity, it will inevitably become a category. If you create a new gender identity, people with a psychology that is similar to yours will be labeled with it, against their will. And we will once again regress to a state where we partition our society based on natural traits. As a liberal, I can't accept that. Say we have someone who claims that their gender feels like they are a ventriloquist dummy, so they call themselves dummy gender. And say that others feel that that suits them, and call themselves dummy gender as well. So now you have a community, and they will start creating customs to express their gender. Like, for instance, putting their hands into each other's anus during sex. Which means that after a while, anyone who likes hands or fingers being put up the anus will be called dummy. And they will also develop a dress code, based on the usual ventriloquist dummy look, with the short hair and the bow tie. In short, something that looks like this. Hmm? What about it, H bomber guy? How would you feel if because you like to dress like this, people will call you dummy and try to put their hands up your ass? Is this really the kind of world you want to live in? At the heart of the social justice ideology lies the belief that the nature of humans is good, and if you let them live according to their nature, they will create a utopian society. So the reason why society isn't utopian is the contemporary social constructs, and if we only bring down these social constructs, like for instance the cis normative, utopia will prevail. Therefore, all means are sacred to obtain this goal, including messing with the minds of youngsters who are confused about their gender. Those of us who aren't slaves to this ideology, however, 
don't believe in this utopian nature of man. We believe that humans evolved from the ape, and like any other animal, they have natural behaviors, some more typical than others. So the normative is not a social construct but the result of human nature, and no matter how much you try you will never change this fact. The actions of the SJWs, then, are not leading us to utopia, but what they are doing is partitioning us, creating people who think along identitarian lines, focusing on what differentiates them from others instead of what unites them. This is one of the reasons why the social justice movement, among its many other sins, is also the main gateway to the alt-right. For those reasons, I cannot possibly accept these gender identities and the underlying logic that comes with them, and must reject them. Which is why it is so important for the SJWs to portray this as an identity thing. In this way, they can present those who oppose them as people who are oppressing minority identities. And so, the social justice movement deflects the conversation from the real issue, which is its undermining of liberal principles. Does it end there? Not by a long shot. We have only scratched the surface. As we recall, the social justice ideology claims that there is no natural link between biological sex, gender identity and gender expression, and they are completely independent from each other. And that leads to other interesting implications. Check out this chick, who goes by the name Kawa. I think a lot of people are beginning to understand the difference between biological sex and gender identity. Uh, the fact that you don't have to identify with the gender that you're assigned at birth based on your biological sex. But what I think a lot of people still have trouble understanding is the difference between gender expression and gender identity, uh, which is the fact that the way you present yourself does not necessarily have to line up with your identity. In my case, for example, I was assigned male at birth, but I choose to identify it as female. She and her is my pronouns and everything else that comes with it, but I continue to present in a masculine way. Everything from my clothes, to my voice, my beard, uh, maybe except maybe for my nails, uh, are traditionally masculine. Kara is way ahead of any of us, and is absolutely right. If we accept SJW logic, then a man can just declare himself to be a woman without changing anything else, and we will have to accept it. So now she can walk into the ladies' showers and take a wash, and if you dare stand in her way, you are a vile transphobic monster. Well, the men among you might say, that sounds like fun. I would also like to identify as a woman sometimes, and enjoy all the privileges that women have in our society. But, hang on, doesn't that mean that I then have to identify as a woman all the time? Fear not, my dudes. The social justice movement has a solution. Recently, the Office of LGBTQ Student Life at Harvard University released a guide which tells us that gender is fluid and changing, and can change from day to day. Which means that you can identify as male whenever you are in a situation that privileges males, and as female when you are in a situation that privileges females. And if anyone tries to say anything about it, accuse them of being transphobic, and ruin their lives. That does sound like a good time, doesn't it? But I don't think we can maintain a society in this way. Now what do they mean when they say that gender is fluid? They mean, of course, that our psychology is fluid. For instance, I identify as a YouTube skeptic. At times I am proud of this identity, and at times you guys are an embarrassing lot. So I fluctuate between being happy and comfortable with this identity, and between feeling alienated to it. However, at all times I still maintain the identity of a YouTube skeptic. In SJW logic, on the other hand, all those different psychological modes are labeled as different identities. And so, this ideology, which pretends to want to help people find their own identity, is actually condemning them to forever be drifting between gender identities, never feeling at home in any of them. How do you identify? I identify as female. In my day-to-day -day life, I dress more masculine than feminine. Um, I like pants, I like wearing sports bras and looking flat-chested. Like t-shirts. You like looking flat-chested? Mm -hmm. That's I'm interesting. Sure yeah. that. Why? I, I don't know. It's something that I've realized fairly recently and cool. kind of become comfortable with. I like wearing sports bras because I like the way it looks to, for me to have a flat chest. But here's the interesting thing. Then on a night out like tonight, I'm very happy to dress in this feminine lacy, yeah. you know, high-waisted, like here are my boobs, and I'm very comfortable with that. Cool. But I in my day-to-day -day life. Huh. How bizarre! A woman who likes to express herself differently at different times, and yet is comfortable with grouping all of these different expressions under the label woman. 
In other words, like every other woman on the planet, except for you poor deluded souls, who put yourselves in the straitjackets of labeling your own psychological modes as identities. You are so deep into this logic that you can't see what damage it is doing to your well-being. However, this total detachment of gender expression from gender identity creates a snag. If the non-binaries don't express their gender identities, how can the world know that they have a different gender? And if it doesn't know, how can it oppress them? They have a label for that identity, but gender identities don't usually come up in a conversation, which means that people will only rarely get a chance to deny them. Say you define yourself as Juxera. How can you give your juxera manifestation in the real world, forcing society to deal with it and oppress it? Well, the social justice movement came up with a solution. It tells these kids that it's not enough that you have your own private gender identity. That gender identity must also have its own pronouns. There are a lot of pronouns out there, like a huge amount. Um, and we're like, people are like slowly and slowly adding more. I've seen a Z, Z, can be spelled a bunch of different ways and it can be declined a bunch of different ways. It's so like declension, like so like he, him, his, and then Z, sometimes you'll see Z here, here, Z, Zim, Zer, there are a lot. There are a lot of options with Z. Um, I've also seen A M Air, like like they, but without the TH. Or Ah, there's so many options. It's so fascinating. Take it the cuddly fellas. Take it the ruffly sweet. Everyone else is jealous. And that's why I repeat. Oh, the wonderful things about tickers. You think of the wonderful things. The tops are made of the rubber. The bottom are made of the spring. The bouncy, trouncy, flouncy, pouncy, fun, 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 fun. But the most wonderful things about tickers is I'm the only one. I'm the only one. And this is where it gets scary. Because as long as it's just names, it doesn't really harm the integrity of our language. The logic of our language allows for people to invent names and titles for themselves. But when it gets to pronouns, the very structure of the language will be changed. Our language is based on the idea that there are male pronouns, female pronouns, and gender neutral pronouns. If we allow this to change, and add pronouns that imply more genders, we will be accepting the regressive logic of the SJWs. That is why it is important for SJWs to push this through. So they are investing a lot in making the non-binaries believe that the grave injustice is being done to them when we refuse to use their pronouns. You need to use those pronouns. It's literally an extension of my arm or my leg. It's, it's just as a part of me as a vital organ. My identity, although you can't see it, still needs to be validated just as much as you would validate the fact that I have five fingers or five toes. Tigger, please. Pronouns are not part of you. They are something that you constructed. Pronouns are part of language, and language is a public thing, which belongs to all of us and affects all of us. So introducing new words into it is a matter that concerns us all, and we have no obligation to accept them. Since these words actually represent a logic that is alien to our language, we reject them. They are also alien to our morality. We want our language to represent enlightened liberal values, not regressive identitarian values. Accepting your pronouns will be accepting the idea that those who are slightly different from others should be singled out and labeled. That is the road to fascism. I would like to make it clear that I totally believe the non-binaries when they say that they are suffering because of it. They are not lying when they say that it pains them when people don't refer to them by their preferred pronouns. But they are placing the blame on the wrong culprit. Instead of realizing that the problem is a social justice ideology that is messing up their psyche, they believe that society should change for them. Instead of being free and happy individuals, they are constantly seeking validation from other people, believing that they have no existence without it. All of that leads to a rather miserable existence. Have you ever been misgendered? How did it feel? How did you handle it? I am misgendered every two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Even, yeah. I mean, even if it's just like somebody being like, here's your drink, miss. I'm like, you're wrong. Why do we code everything we do with gender mm -hmm. and it bothers me so much and it's it's like i hate it it makes me feel like i'm not part of my body when that happens yeah you know what that is caitlin that is what is known as being schizoid you have an inner world that is at odds with your social identity so whenever you are reminded of the way society sees you you feel a sharp sense of alienation but this schizoid state is totally self-inflicted you bought the lie that our society defines the two genders rigidly 
in a way that excludes you. Once the SJWs made you accept this lie, they made you adopt a logic that is contradictory to our logic, and by this logic you believe that your private psychology should be given a label of its own. But since your logic cannot coexist with ours, you are doomed to always live in a world that will not recognize this label. Unless you break out of this mental cell you put yourself in, you will always be alienated and miserable. Look, like I said at first, I do believe that some people genuinely find it hard to define themselves as either male or female, and I support creating a category for them. Adding one more category to represent the exception does not contradict the logic of our language, and does not contradict liberal thought. And what follows from that is that we should also create one more pronoun, to refer to people of that category. You want to change our language to contain he, she, and z? Fine. I will stand with you in this effort, and I believe that we will not have much problem getting society to accept it. I agree, it is extremely trivial. When someone comes up to me and says, I'd rather you refer to me by these pronouns from now on, I say, yeah, alright, because it's really not that hard, and it doesn't really affect my life all that much. Drop and Z dead. There is no way that I will give my hand to the partitioning of our society according to SJW ideology. I can't believe that you are so naive, H. Bomber guy, that you don't understand what a profound effect it will have on your life, as well as the life of everyone else. A society that labels anyone who is slightly different, and categorizes them as a different identity, is a society I don't want to live in, and I suspect you don't either. I would like you to explain to me how this is harmless. Now let's go back to our 21st century schizoid androgenes. Until now, we have seen them mainly as victims of the social justice ideology. Not malicious people, but people who are confined to live in a world of their own. We're at VidCon and it's just not very often that you can like surround yourself with mm -hmm. people who also are like you in the way that they're not cis. Yeah. Yeah. So that's all they're saying. They are saying that they are not cis and want us to validate them. However, there is another type of not cis people. Let's call them neo-Nazis. The neo-Nazis are not just begging us to validate them, they aggressively demand it. They are themselves SJWs, who believe that they have the right to use all means necessary to achieve their goals. Thus, they become the foot soldiers of the social justice movement. And in some places, they even manage to pass laws that give them protection. Wait, I hear you saying. I thought you told us that our society doesn't accept their logic. How come it passes laws based on it then? Well, that is because many people in our society are passive aggressives. They are unaware of what's going on, and don't realize that there is an attempt to undermine liberal society. They think that they are acting as good liberals when they are passing these laws, not realizing that they are actually serving the agenda of the regressive left. And so, we get bills like Bill C-16 in Canada, which makes gender identity protected as a human rights issue. The bill passed into law in June 2017, which means that it might now become criminal in Canada to refuse to use someone's personally invented pronouns. One man who realized the danger in this law and tried to warn against it was Jordan Peterson, a professor of psychology in the University of Toronto. Peterson became famous when he warned against the implications of the bill, and announced that he will not acquiesce to the demand to use these pronouns. In a debate that took place on Canadian TV in October 2016, Peterson pretty much takes the position that I presented here. He has no problem with people expressing themselves however they want, he accepts that people can have the opposite gender to their biological sex, and he is willing to accept adding another pronoun for those who fall in the middle between the two genders. What he objects to is the idea that anyone can invent new genders and pronouns, and then use the law to force us to recognize them. For that, he gets accused of hate speech by the regressive SJW gender studies scholar, while at the same time dismissed by the passive regressive professor of law, who says that there is no chance that this law will be used to accuse him of hate speech. All of this has been widely discussed since, but I want to focus on something else that happened in this debate, and got less attention. There is also a non-binary person on the show, who is involved in this exchange. Um, and, you know, I was thinking before I came here, I was thinking about, uh, I grew up in the Bronx, and, and um, I was born in 61, so um, I remember very well when we went from, from Mrs. to Ms., and my father was appalled, and he kept saying Ms., and he thought that was funny because if you couldn't actually identify somebody as either, uh, particularly a female, as either married or single, then 
The notion chaos, of, the chaos no, the right? The notion of characterizing a woman independent of her marital That's status right. was controversial and, 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 at the time. And apparently very, very confusing. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm reminded of that when, 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 there's the, when the suggestion is made that somehow if, if we have words that don't fit into a, a, something that we're very familiar with and that we've used to date, that chaos will ensue, that everyone will well, be confused. There's, there's two, I don't believe that. There's the, no evidence of that historically. I, I, I hear you, but the, there was no law obliging people to use the word Actually, Ms. But Credit to the host. He caught the false equivalence of equating a situation of a language that changed organically to a situation in which the will of an ideological minority is enforced by law on everyone. But he missed the bigger false equivalence. The adoption of the word Ms. came about because we didn't want to distinguish between people by labeling them. What the SJWs are pushing for now is the exact opposite of that. The equivalence would be that now, after we've learned to refer to all women as Ms, there will be a small group of women who will demand that we make a title for a woman in her 20s who never married, for a woman in her 30s who never married, for a woman in her 40s who never married, for a woman who was married once, for a woman who was married twice, for a woman who was married once and now has up to three cats, for a woman who was married twice and now has more than three cats, and so forth and so forth. Now once these labels exist, they will of course be used for everyone. And should a woman complain about her marital status being branded in such a way, she would be charged with hate speech. This is how the regressive left promotes its agenda. It pretends to be the extension of the liberal struggles of the past, when in fact it is the exact opposite. As the bill was being discussed in the Canadian Senate, there have been others who raised an alarming voice. Gad Saad, a professor of evolutionary psychology in Concordia University, came to testify before the Senate, only to find out that the passive-aggressive senators are incapable of understanding the problem. So again, I, I, I really don't know, I can't speak about the legal issues. Harvard University, a rather prestigious university, is arguing that to argue that something is due to biological essentialism is a form of transphobia. Well, my whole field, all of evolutionary biology and all of evolutionary psychology would then be committing that systemic violence. So what would I do? What, what would you suggest for me to do when I walk into class next fall and I wish to teach about sexual selection, which is the mechanism that explains how traits and behaviors evolve across the two sexes? Would that be transphobic? Would that be something that I'm allowed to do or not? I, I don't know. I can't speak to the legality. I'll defer to your legal expertise. Could the, could the government place me under a legal transgression if this were to pass? No. No? No. no. Okay. Ha ha ha, what a silly professor. How can this bill be used for bad means? Who could possibly think to try and prevent ideas from being freely discussed and taught in academia? This is pure nonsense. Well, to be fair to the senator, for a long time nothing happened. From the moment the bill passed into law, it took a full five months until we got the first case of Professor Saad's fears coming to fruition. A teaching assistant named Lindsay Shepard, from the Wilfrid Laurier University in Ontario, had a discussion in a class about gender pronouns, and showed part of the Jordan Peterson debate we just saw. When word of it got to the neo-Nazis on campus, they filed a complaint, and Shepard was taken before the Social Justice Inquisition. And she had the good sense to record it all, and expose the mechanism of how it's done. What we hear on the tape are three people who are demonizing Professor Peterson with a string of lies. They claim that he is alt-right, they compare him to white supremacists, they portray him as a conspiracy theorist, and they accuse him of doxing trans students. They did not come up with those lies themselves, they have been made up in the social justice field that they dwell in. Once they establish his demonic image, they claim that by merely presenting him in class, Shepard had created a threatening environment for the transgender students. And, they say, Canadian law requires of the university to not allow such things to go on in class. A teaching climate that you're creating. And this is actually, these arguments are counter to the Canadian um, Human Rights Code. Uh, ever since, and I know that you talked about um, C-16, ever since this past, it is discriminatory to be targeting someone um, due to their gender identity or gender expression. But, sorry, what did I violate in that policy? Um, so, gender-based violence, uh, transphobia in that policy. Causing harm um, to trans students by uh, bringing their identity as invalid or their 
uh, pronouns as invalid or something of potentially a invalid. Could the, could the government place me under illegal transgression if this were to pass? No. 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 And so this is where we are today. I don't want you to worry too much. This is just the latest attempt by the radical left to bring down Western democracy, and it's going to be beaten back just like in previous times. The question is how many people will have to suffer from it until it falls? How many kids who are confused about their gender identity will be forced into those confining labels, and will be doomed to an alienated, depressed and suicidal existence? How many people who will speak up against this madness will be accused of transphobia and hate speech, and have their lives ruined as a result? How many people will be forced into silence, into not expressing their views, because they'll fear the backlash? This is why we need to defeat this as soon as possible. Dear non-binary people, you are being duped. You are being sacrificed on the altar of the social justice ideology. They are lying to you and telling you that male and female are rigidly defined, so you have no place within the binary. They are lying to you and telling you that biological sex and gender identity vary independently, so that the cis normative is just a social construct that is oppressing you. They are lying to you and telling you that you can invent your own gender identity, and that makes it real. And they are lying to you and telling you that all of this ideological tripe is based in science. Their main goal is to present liberal society as oppressive, and they are indoctrinating you and using you as cannon fodder in this battle. If you don't break out of this indoctrination, you will always be miserable. And as for you, H bomber guy, this monstrosity is what you are veiling when you refuse to present your side, and instead deflect to discuss the inaccuracies made by those who criticize it. You are an intelligent guy, and this is what you choose to do with your intelligence. You defend the social justice ideology, an ideology that is anti-freedom, anti-equality, anti-diversity, anti-democracy, anti-logic, anti-science, anti-truth, anti-beauty, anti-art, anti-sex and anti-love, an ideology that presents the biggest threat to social justice that the West has seen in many decades. You make fun of the people who oppose it, without bothering to engage with the argument. But you also expressed your wish that the skeptics would take your criticism to heart, and maybe learn something. Well, I accepted your challenge, and considered your points. This was my counter-argument. I await your response.